are ready to begin. I know this is in your flyer, but I'm going to introduce Dr. Susan Satterfield. She is board certified in both internal medicine and lifestyle medicine. She is the lead physician for the Cypress Internal Medicine Outpatient Clinic at the Patewood location. And her focus is on empowering patients to optimize their health through lifestyle mod modification. She's gonna be speaking on the benefits of whole foods, plant-based diet, and the emerging evidence of its direct impact on and progression of Parkinson's disease. So, Dr. Susan Satterfield, thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm always excited to, uh, about getting a chance to speak about something I'm very passionate about. So, I have to start with dedicating this talk to my dad, who I lost to a very aggressive form of Parkinson's about five years ago at age 72. Um, I wish I had known then what I know now so that I could have maybe helped him a little bit more. I wish that just one doctor of all the doctors he saw knew some of the information that I know so they could have offered that to us as a choice. So I really feel called to spread this information because whether you use it or decide not to, at least you have a more informed decision to make. So the objectives for this talk, I'm going to define what a whole food plant-based diet is and what it consists of, explain the basic concepts of epigenetics, show the link between lifestyle behavior and choices and the risk of, of disease, and that specifically of diet and Parkinson's, and then recommend some ways to incorporate plant-based eating into your life. So, what is this whole food plant-based diet that's going to save us? A whole food looks like it did when it grew from the ground with minimal to no processing. It's plant-based, so derived from plants, vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, legumes, whole grains, with few to no animal products. And these are the only food groups that have ever been proven to reduce disease and prolong life. And most people are very familiar with them. Legumes are beans, peas, and lentils, but the intact whole grains can throw people, so we'll spend a minute talking about that. It means it contains 100% of the original kernel, the bran, the germ, and the endosperm. And an example of that would be brown rice. Now, once you strip the fiber and most of the nutrients, you're left with white rice. They did a study at, uh, looking at a group of women who were overweight, and half of them they added a cup of brown rice to their diet daily and the other half a cup of white. After six weeks, they switched and those getting brown then got white and vice versa. And each six week group, when they were receiving brown rice, had more weight loss, lower blood pressure, and less inflammation. So processing a plant not only changes its nutrient density, but how we process it and how the body responds to it. So some examples of intact whole grains that you're probably more familiar with, steel-cut oatmeal, brown rice, quinoa, farro, corn on the cob, and there is an extensive list beyond this. Processed grains, things like cereal, white pasta, breads, pastries, all the extensive um, choices of snack box foods, snacky box foods. Um, and as you can see, we love those processed foods. We eat the majority of our diet from them. The standard American diet is appropriately coined fat. We are eating only 6% of our calories from unprocessed plants. The standard American diet compared to a whole food plant-based diet is going to give you more fat, more animal protein, and more processed carbohydrate and a lot less fiber. You're also going to miss out on more than 100,000 natural phytonutrients that fight disease and keep us healthy, including protecting against disease of the brain. The fiber is a critical player in our health. It lowers sugar, the risk of diabetes, it lowers cholesterol, cancer risk, cravings, weight, constipation, and it's naturally found in every single plant and can never be found in animal products. And as a lifestyle physician, our organization recommends that we get a minimum of 40 grams a day, and the average American is getting 15 to 18. So these 
processed grains, again, the fiber has been removed, and so there's a naturally rapid absorption as sugar, and a, and a rapid and high rise in sugar in the blood, which then requires the pancreas to work harder to put out, put out an unnaturally high amount of insulin to get the sugar back down to normal. And this process is associated with nearly all chronic diseases. So, why should we care? Well, because chronic disease is the number one healthcare challenge of the 21st century. Six out of ten have at least one chronic disease, and four in ten have two or more. And we're spending 90% of the $3.3 trillion on healthcare on managing disease. And then you may say, well, why should I care? I have Parkinson's. I already have my, my disease. And the truth is, you're unlikely to die of that disease. As you can see, these are the top ten causes of death in our country. Seven of them are chronic diseases, and Parkinson's is not listed here. In 1900, only 16% of people died of chronic disease, and by 2009, it was 70%. Number one and two, heart disease and cancer account for almost half of all deaths. And according to a John Hopkins study, number three is actually medical error. Not only is yes, <laughs> that is my profession, yes. Um, so, um, and not only is it killing us, it's killing us earlier. So that in 2000, 2017, we had the first three-year consecutive drop in life expectancy since World War I. And the 2018 date is not out yet. And yet we know that most chronic disease is optional. The changes in lifestyle, behavior, and habits can prevent well over 80% of all heart disease, stroke, and type 2 diabetes, and over 40% of cancer, and most experts feel these numbers are conservative and low, it's more than that. So, we know that lifestyle clearly impacts disease risk, but what's, what's the link? And that's where epigenetics comes in. Epi means on, and genetics is your genes, or your, your DNA. So, you cannot change actual DNA sequence that you're born with, the nucleotide base, how they're arranged. But every day, all day long, we make choices that then impact the genes. These choices put little, what we'll call little tags on, on the DNA. And these tags affect how it's folded, and the folding affects how it's packaged, and it affects um, gene accessibility. So genes that are easier to access are more likely to be expressed. So there are many things that cause these tags, and in fact, they start as early as when we're in the womb as to what our mother is choosing to do. But, you know, drinking, smoking, drugs, stress, sleep, all of these things um, impact it. But this is good news, because it means your DNA is not your destiny. And when they look at studies that monozygous or identical twins, their epigenetics, as you can imagine early on, are almost indistinguishable. But as they live their lives and make different choices, one can go on to have heart disease and cancer, and the other one live a very long life with almost no disease. And so experts today feel that your genes are impacting your disease risk by at most 10%, and lifestyle is around 90%. So looking at um, some of the ways we came to these conclusions uh, with this, these connections. Dan Buechner in 2005 discovered the five places in the world where people live the longest, healthiest lives. He coined them the blue zones. And what did they all have in common? Number one, a plant-based diet. It was heavy on lagoons, beans, beans, and lentils. They didn't smoke. They engaged in regular physical activity. They didn't sit for long periods all day. They were uh, socially engaged and they had good family support. Dean Ornish has done many studies on lifestyle disease, and one of his more famous is the prostate cancer lifestyle trial. He took men with early prostate cancer, half received standard care, and half got, full, got a whole foods plant-based diet, stress reduction, root support, and exercise. And in two years, only 5% of the lifestyle group needed treatment, compared to 27% in the standard group. And so in the lifestyle group, he not only shows the of cancer growth, but changes in the expression of over 
500 genes, and that's the power of epigenetics. So how about specifically diet and disease? Well, the Adventist Health Studies 1 and 2 were important for this. The Adventists tend to have similar lifestyles. They typically don't drink, they don't smoke, they don't participate in high-risk behavior. Um, a large um, part of them um, are vegetarian, but some are semi-vegetarian and some eat meat. And so they were able to specifically look at um, how disease fell among these um, groups with different diets. And what they found was there's a stepwise reduction in diabetes, high blood pressure, and weight as one eats more plant-based. And that regular meat consumption is associated with a 93 to 97% increase in developing diabetes. Most people aren't aware of this association. They only think of sugar when they think of diabetes. And we'll touch on this a little bit more in a few slides. Colin Campbell did one of the most comprehensive nutritional studies ever done, the China study. He was fascinated at the fact that rural China had drastically lower rates of diabetes, heart disease, and cancer compared to the West. And what he found was that the most significant difference was that they limited their um, animal products to no more than 10 of their calories. The EPIC study looked at over half a million people, found that for every 5% of calories from animal protein, there was a 30% increase in diabetes. No association with plant protein. Processed meats were associated with increased death from heart disease and cancer. And meat consumption was again associated with weight gain, just like in the Adventist Health Study. And actually chicken was the strongest. And this is an important point in a culture that believes chicken is a weight loss food. And this may have something to do with the way we're processing them now. Um, the meat that we buy for consumption, over 95% of it comes from animals that are raised on factory farms. And so because of demand, they're giving these animals things such as hormones to rapidly grow them. And so that now today's chicken has two to three times the amount of fat, a third more calories, and a third less protein than it did back in 1940. Dr. Colwell Esselstyn is famous for his landmark study where he took 18 of the sickest patients at Cleveland Clinic. They had had so many open heart surgeries, bypasses, and stents that they were told there was nothing else they could do for them to go home, get their affairs in order, and they would not live much longer. And he put them on a strict, low-fat, whole food, plant-based diet. Nothing else, that's all he put, didn't, didn't even tell them to do anything else, just do this diet. And at one year, you can see the blockage that was there in this main artery completely opened up. So it, it, the body literally melted the plaque away. No cholesterol drug, no statin has ever been able to prove that. In fact, the, the most they've been able to prove in a statin is that while you're on it, your plaque continues to grow, but just at a slower rate than if you weren't on it. And at 12 years out, he showed again, no extension in plaque, no events, no heart attacks, no need for stents. So he refers to the current treatment of heart disease as palliative versus the curative effects of a plant-based diet. So the evidence is clear. So why are we all so sick? Well, according to this Mayo study, it's because no one is choosing healthy behaviors. And why is that? Because we live in a culture where the standard me medical practice is that doctors are trained on diseases and drugs. And most physicians in this country, including myself, received zero classes on nutrition throughout our entire training. So patients and doctors are unaware of lifestyle data. So we're both taught to believe that it's just your genes, there's nothing you can do. Your mom had diabetes, your dad had heart disease, it's just gonna happen, we're so sorry, but good news, we have all these drugs that you can take. And this leaves the patient powerless. And, I don't, and the, the goal of, of this model is to manage chronic disease. I don't consider this health care, I consider it sick care. And so where has this sick care gotten us? Well, over 70% of, of adults are overweight or obese and about a third of our teenagers. Currently one in 10 adults are diabetic and by 2050 it's expected it will be one in three, which is financially unsustainable. We already have one in three that are pre-diabetic and the vast majority have no idea. 
Heart disease is our number one killer, counting for one in four deaths, and we have a heart attack every 40 seconds in this country. One in three of us in this room will have invasive cancer, and that's not even counting the little cancers on your skin that you get shaved off, but invasive cancer, and one in five will die from it. And yet we know that only 5% of cancers are from inherited mutations of your genes, of your DNA. The rest is largely impacted by lifestyle. So lifestyle is medicine. We want to target the root cause of disease, prescribe lifestyle modification when appropriate so that we can prevent, improve, and even reverse disease. And that way we reduce the need for medical services, which reduces costs and also risk to the patient, and thereby empower the patient to take back control of their health. The goal in this model is to optimize health. This is healthcare. So how about specifically the link between diet and Parkinson's? I think it's important to first touch on the, the rapidly rising incidence. It's now the second most common neurodegenerative disorder behind Alzheimer's. We went from 2.5 million worldwide in 1990 to 6.1 million in 2016. And today it's about 10 million worldwide. It's the fastest growing sor source of disability due to ne neurologic disorders and now the 14th leading killer in the US. So is this epidemic completely out of our control? Well, interestingly, when you look at Parkinson's, there's significant variability in the age of onset, which symptoms are most prominent in that specific person, and how severe the symptoms are. And when something is from a direct mutation that's passed from one generation to the next, you usually don't have that much variability. It looks much more similar. Like an example would be Huntington's disease. And so now with more research, we know, yes, only 10% are from genetic mutations, and 90% are sporadic. Well, sporadic means epigenetics are involved, which means lifestyles involved. And when you look at areas that still eat a primarily plant-based diet, you have significantly lower Parkinson's disease rates. So what are some Parkinson's disease risk factors related to diet? Excess body weight, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, high fat diet, dairy, and toxins. And what do all of these have in common? Underlying insulin resistance, some association with insulin resistance. And again, it, it does, just like we learned from the studies before, it is not just sugar that causes insulin resistance. Animal protein, excess fat, and processed food. And of course, sugar is, a, is one of the processed foods we eat. So insulin resistance. We know if someone eats more than they need um, and they become overweight, you will have fat deposited under the skin. We can see that. But a lot of people are unaware that you're also at the same time depositing that fat in your organs. And once you have fat in your liver, that's equivalent to an insulin resistant state, which we know is toxic to the brain. And in fact, Alzheimer's is now often referred to as type 3 diabetes of the brain. And I think the only reason Parkinson's doesn't have some similar term is because its research is lagging behind that of Alzheimer's. But when you look, the risk of developing Parkinson's disease is 40% higher in diabetics than non-diabetics. So again, going back to that underlying theme, not enough fiber, too much fat, too much animal protein, which is the standard American diet, leads to an insulin resistant state, which increases the risk of all chronic disease, including those of the brain. So we'll go through each one of them. So a high fat diet, we know increases the risk of Parkinson's disease. On average, Americans eat 85 pounds of fats and oils a year, which comes out to about 106 grams a day. And for optimal health, um, the experts in lifestyle medicine in this field feel like it should be closer to 30 grams. So dairy has repeatedly been linked to an increased risk of Parkinson's. One theory is that animal fat causes inflammation, and inflammation weakens barriers. And we have a 
gut blood barrier trying to protect what goes into the bloodstream from our, our, our gut, and also a blood-brain barrier protecting what comes from our blood into the brain. But that inflammation weakens the barriers, and then you can have pesticides and toxins from the dairy as well as from other sources that can cross into the brain and cause damage. The food industry wants you to think of things like cheese as a low-carb, high-protein, healthy snack. First, let me point out that no study has ever proven that low-carb, high-protein reduces disease risk or is healthy. And cheese, in fact, 70% of its calories come from fat. It's primarily fat and primarily saturated fat, which is the worst kind. And we are eating about 35 pounds per person per year. Also, cow's milk has repeatedly been shown to, to increase the risk of Parkinson's disease. Why, one theory is that cow milk protein is seen as foreign. We're the only species to drink another species milk. So it's understandable that we would see it as foreign, just like we see a virus or bacteria as foreign. So our immune system can rev up and then make antibodies to attack that. And then it, it, and those antibodies can then cross the blood-brain barrier and mistakenly attack some of our own neurons and, and brain cells. So let's go on to some of the toxins that we get exposed to through meat. One is heterocyclic amines. These are chemicals formed when meat is cooked. And the higher the temperature, the longer the cooking time, the more direct the heat, then the higher level of HCAs that are formed. And they're neurotoxic, and they block dopamine formation. And on average, we're, uh, Americans are eating 270 pounds of meat per year. This is per person. Another uh, toxin would be nitrites. They are added to meats as prefer preservatives and to add color and flavor. And some of examples of those high in nitrates would be cured and smoked meats, hot dogs, bacon, sausage, um, and all the deli meats in the grocery store. And they've been shown to increase death rates in Parkinson's disease. And, uh, and also, the World Health Organization has long since define them as a class 1A carcinogen, which means we know without a doubt from studies it causes cancer. And I believe the only reason there's not a label on every package of these foods saying causes cancer is because the food industry is so powerful. And when you look at our history, it took over 7,000 studies showing that smoking was harmful before the first uh, Surgeon General's warning was placed on cigarettes. Another toxin is harmane. Just like HCAs, it increases the longer you cook a meat and the higher the temperature. And it, and it is a potent tremor producing neurotoxin. Um, and we certainly know that Parkinson's patients don't need anything else contributing to their existing tremor. Pesticides is another um, big toxin. So, um, and we know that the highest level of pesticides are in foods that are highest on food chains because it continues to concentrate as you go up. So, so animals higher on the food chain. Yes, we care about uh, pesticides that are on plants and fruits and vegetables that we eat, but it's going to be a fraction of how much is going to be um, higher on the food chain. And again, we have most of the meat coming from factory farms, and they often use remains, uh, unused remains of animals to put back into the feed to then feed other animals. So you're over and over, you're concentrating these pesticides in these animals. Some people then say, well, fish must be the best because it's lower on the chain. That would be true, except because we polluted our, pot our waters so severely, they're an important source of brain damaging chemicals such as polychlorinated biphenyls and methylmercury. But the Environmental Defense Fund, you can look this up on the website, does a great job. This shows you how many servings of these fish are safe to eat per month. And as you can see, a lot of them are actually zero. Okay, so the other issue with meat is that it's a very highly concentrated protein source. And we have that gut-blood barrier we talked about. Well, protein competes with L-DOPA, precursor to make dopamine, to get inside into the bloodstream. 
And so we know from studies that high protein diets reduce the effectiveness of Parkinson's medications. And let's talk just a minute about protein because our country is obsessed with protein and very confused. We are always, where every patient I talk to is very worried about, are they getting enough protein? Where should they get their protein? We actually need very little protein. The average um, height, you know, male and female is around 40 grams a day. Um, we have, um, and, and the average American is getting 70 to 100 grams a day. So much, much more than we need. So the only people in this country who have a protein deficiency are those who are literally starving, who have been on a very, very reduced calorie diet for an extended period of time and are wasting away. Everyone else has a protein excess problem. So a couple more protein truths. When you eat all that excess protein, that three times what we're supposed to get, when you eat that, and if our body doesn't need that protein, those building blocks and amino acids at that time to repair tissue and muscle, then it doesn't get stored as protein and amino acids. It gets converted and stored as fat, which again supports those studies that show the more meat you eat, the more likely you are to be overweight. And then I hear a lot of people say, but you need meat for, to, get, to get all the amino acids. That's just not true. Plants are a complete protein source, including all essential amino acids. Essential amino acids are the ones that we can't make ourselves, that we have to get from eating. But essential amino acids are made by plants. They are not made by animals. So humans and animals must eat plants to survive or eat animals that have eaten plants. So it always comes back to the plants. And animal protein, but not plant protein, um, causes a rise in IGF-1, which is insulin growth-like factor one, which is associated with the growth and spread of cancer and most chronic diseases. So how about some protective factors in the diet for Parkinson's? Unsaturated fats, flavonoids, antioxidants, phytonutrients, lower cal calorie diets, and caffeine. And what do they all have in common? They're all found naturally in plants. So we'll start with the first, unsaturated fats. First, it's important to know that our brain is mostly fat. It's lipid. It's made with fatty acids. There's three kinds of fatty acids, saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated. What are the primary sources of saturated? Meat and full fat dairy, and these are inflammatory. The primary sources of unsaturated are going to be plants, and they're anti-inflammatory and neuroprotective. So polyunsaturated fats are very important. DHA is critical in brain um, growth and development, um, protects the neurons against toxins and death, help regulate dopamine activity in the basal ganglia, and is shown to have a protective role in, in Parkinson's. So DHA is one of the omega-3s. Most people think fish oil when they think omega-3. Guess what? DHA is made by plants, not fish. Fish get it by eating plants, by eating algae. So I prefer to recommend a plant-based source of omega-3, and that way you don't take the risk, have the risk of getting all those PCBs and methylmercury in that fish oil supplement that you're taking. Flavonoids have shown to have a neuroprotective effect on Parkinson's, and they're rich in many plant-based foods, as you can see here, and beverages, tea and coffee. Antioxidants. They reduce oxidative stress, which means they reduce free radicals, which are harmful to cells and tissues. And in general, they've been found to be low in most Parkinson's disease patients. But yet, just eating any fruits and vegetables will give you more antioxidants. And in fact, cruciferous vegetables, your cauliflower, cabbage, broccoli, those have been found to be particularly neuroprotective. Phytonutrients are natural chemicals made by plants to help protect them. Um, and for their health. And the great news is these health benefits get transferred to whoever eats them. And it's been shown to reduce the functional decline as one ages and to slow the progression of Parkinson's disease. And here's um, just some examples of some of the phytonutrients and what they're associated with, lycopene, a decrease in cancer, 
the um, anthocyanins and improvement in memory and so on. Lower calorie diets have repeatedly been shown to prolong lifespan and decrease age-related diseases. They're associated with a decreased risk of developing Parkinson's. And in animal sh studies, are showing promise because it uh, showed slowing of decline in Parkinson's. And with a low-fat, whole food, plant-based diet, you don't have to count calories. You're naturally going to get less calories than a standard American diet, but you're going to be full and satisfied because of all the fiber you're going to get. Caffeine, I'm sure you've all been told, um, has repeatedly been found to be associated with a decreased risk of Parkinson's. There's a protective effect on dopamine neurons. It slows the progression of Parkinson's, and about two cups a day was shown to improve motor symptoms. Smoking. Why would I talk about smoking in a nutrition talk? Because there actually is a diet link. So y'all probably all have been told those who have a smoking history have only about half the risk of developing Parkinson's compared to non-smokers. Why? Well, nicotine appears to be neuroprotective. Where does nicotine come from? A tobacco plant. Well, is it in other plants? Yes, it is. It's in all nightshade plants, eggplant, potatoes, tomatoes, and peppers. So smoke or eat plants. Smoking increases the risk of lung cancer, stroke, heart disease. Not a good choice. Nightshade plants reduce risk of Parkinson's. I'd go with that one. So what are some other benefits of a whole food plant-based diet, specifically on Parkinson's? A high complex carbohydrate diet, which you're gonna get, eat if you eat plants, is associated with increased dopamine production compared to meat, eggs, and dairy, which block dopamine precursors and are associated with less dopamine. High fiber diet and having um, less or no dairy, both are going to improve constipation. And lower fat intake means you will lose weight. Slimmer body means improved mobility and reversal of any insulin resistance, which we know is neurotoxic. So what are some plant-based eating tips. Number one, again, you don't have to count anything. You don't have to worry about how many grams of protein or, um, or, or um, carbohydrate did I get. You just eat a variety of plants and it will naturally be there. Every single plant that grows out of the ground has all three macronutrients, fat, carbohydrate, and protein in the perfect ratio we were intended to get it. And it has all these other wonderful things that we talked about. Number two, you do want to get organic when you can to reduce pesticide exposure. But the Environmental Working Group does a great job of updating this list every year. You can just look it up online. The Dirty Dozen are the fruits and vegetables that absorb the most pesticides. And so you want to, whenever you can, get organic with those versus the Clean 15 are more resistant to absorbing the pesticides and are safer if they're not organic. Number three, vegan does not always mean healthy. All of these food substances, I won't say real food, are vegan. But an unhealthy vegan diet has been shown to be just as harmful as a standard American diet. So don't let the food industry fool you. They have now figured out that if they put buzzwords on packages like strong, protein, natural, organic, that we'll buy them thinking they're contributing to our health, but make no mistake, these are not real food. We're just growing expensive food deserts with empty calories. And you can sustain life on these calories, but it'll be a sicker and shorter life. Processed food can never replicate the benefits that plants will give us naturally. And just take one step at a time. Don't try to do everything at once. Maybe try to choose a plant for a snack. I tell my patients, if you're really hungry between a meal, it has to be from the ground. If, you're, if none of that sounds good, you're not really hungry. Number two, make a salad into a meal. Not just lettuce. You're going to get bored of that. It's not going to fill you up. Put good stuff on your, on your salad. Put seeds and butternut squash and whole wheat pasta and beans. Uh, try to fill your plate with... Um, at least half your plate with veggies whenever you can. Limit meat to once a day or less if you can. You know, some people are starting out eating meat three times a day. Just go down by even one meal if you, if you can. 
Um, and then look at the portion size, not our restaurant portion size. Think deck of cards or less. Steel cut oatmeal or overnight oats for breakfast is delicious. There's lots of easy recipes uh, online. And then consider fruit for dessert. And a lot of people look at me like I'm crazy when I say that. But it's because our palate has been deadened by all the salt, oil, and sugar that it gets exposed to. And it takes about two weeks to clean that palate up. And then everything tastes amazing. And fruit actually is a good dessert. My children will even eat apple slices and raisins for dessert. So that's always my test. What, what will my kids do? All right, so try one recipe each week. That won't be overwhelming. And you can Google whole food plant-based and then fill in whatever food you just love that normally has meat. And, you'll, and lots of stuff will pop up. Just make sure you do the whole food plant-based part and not just no meat, um, whatever, because um, then you don't know what other unnatural foods and high-fat oil um, ingredients will be in it. So, here's just a list of some of the things that you'll reduce your risk for. And it, the list goes on um, even further than that. And then, what are you like to, likely to experience? Improved absorption of your medications, which means reduced symptoms, uh, reduced constipation, a slimmer body means easier mobility, improved mood, uh, mood and energy level, improved immune function, which means less illness, and a longer, healthier life. So this is my favorite right here. The food you eat can either be the safest and most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. Thank you very much. Any questions? Carol, I have a, a mic. I'm going to bring it around so you, so you can ask your question. Yeah, what about beer? And the purine, right? Beer? Yes. It, does, it is from hops that grow from the ground. And I do like a beer occasionally, no. But, um, but it's, so alcohol in general um, is, not a, is not a health food. When you, when you look at the nurse's health study, they found that having about half a, an, out of an alcoholic beverage um, a day was associated with improved health. And what we believe is it probably wasn't the alcohol, but the relaxation, the social engagement, the wind down time, reduction in stress. Now, we do feel, the consensus is that small, moderate amounts of alcohol we can handle, just like toxins and pesticides. Our body can filter and handle a little bit of these things, but not too much. So keeping it on the lower end, half a drink to one drink, um, you, know, normal, you know, once a day at the most, or a few times a week, um, appears to be safe. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. Um, so, so different um, toxins, and, and it's specifically to Parkinson's, is that what you mean, or just yeah. for health? You know what, I, I'll be honest, I'm not, a, I'm not aware of that data, so I can look into that and get back to you. I don't know, I'll look at that. It's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I was listening to a podcast of, I think it's Victor or Vector Longo, yes, who has familiar. done a lot of research in fasting. In fasting. Yes. And he stated, he's all about the whole food plant-based, mm -hmm. until you get to about age 65. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he said, older, which to me it's not that much older because I'm about there, but um, need more, I guess, animal protein, so could you uh, comment yes. on that? Yes, so, um, so it does appear that those over 65 do need a little bit more protein because of some impaired absorption. Absorption just goes down a little bit. Um, he feels like the, there are some benefits in adding some fish um, and certain um, animal proteins. There are, there's not data supporting specifically that. I think there's data Enough, to, and I have a great respect for him, and I, and I, and I, so I, um, I love to listen to everything he says. But I personally believe the data supports that yes, um, those over 65 need a little bit more protein, but that plant protein is always healthier than animal protein. And again, 
having two servings a week, just like I said, having a little bit, it doesn't have to be zero. Just like in the China study, they kept it to 10% of their calories, is going to be just fine. And some of the fatty fish, and especially if we didn't have all the chemicals in them, um, but like the best one would be wild caught Alaskan salmon. You get omega 3s from that, and it has some of the least amount of pesticides in it. I'm just curious about pro and prebiotics. Um, do you recommend them? That's a good question. So that is definitely the rave right now. Um, pre and probiotics. So um, your probiotics are all your good um, gut bacteria, and we know that your microbiome, the, the bacteria that live in your gut, are critical for your health. Um, the research is just ramping on, uh, and exploding on this. And prebiotics are what do those bacteria like to eat, and depending on what you eat, you then change completely your, um, your gut bacteria. And so when you think of the of the millions of bacteria in your gut, and you're taking a little capsule with, with a few thousand in it. Um, it it's really um, nothing compared to what your, how your diet is going to impact your microbiome. So there are certain times I recommend it if someone's on an antibiotic or they have some sort of inflammatory bowel disease and there's a lot of inflammation going on, they just recently had a gut infection, then I'll tell someone, you know what, it might be a good idea to help um, replenish and um, take some extra good quality probiotics for a few weeks, but not chronically every day, because there is some concern that even then you're selecting out for those, just the ones that were chosen in that capsule, and we should get a variety. So the best thing to do, and prebiotics is fiber, basically. So you want to eat as much as fiber as you can, um, as healthy of a diet as you can, and then you're going to um, have a beautiful microbiome. There's two questions. Uh, I'm working on the proposition that a little red wine is good for you. Uh huh. Uh, would you speak to that? And also, is there any diet that would help dizziness or imbalance? Okay, so the 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 red wine. Um, there are um, like resveratrol, like different antioxidants in red wine that are beneficial. Now, you can get antioxidants, like we said, in most fruits and vegetables. So what I tell people is you don't need to start drinking red wine if that's not your thing. But if you enjoy it, you know, having half a glass or one glass, you know, uh, a few nights a week, you know, it raises a little bit of good cholesterol, it has some antioxidants. So yes, there are, are some health benefits, but you can then drink too much of it and then you have negative health benefits, an increase in um, blood pressure and so on. Specifically for dizziness, you know, really, and now as far as balance, you know, that's going to be more what's going to be good for your, um, for your body structure, your muscle tone, um, how much um, body fat you have on yourself. And so, again, a plant-based diet is going to do that because we're going to get, uh, we're going to stay lean um, and, have, and have everything we need to build good, healthy muscle. Now, dizziness like a vertigo or a dizziness that comes from centrally from the brain, no, I don't know of any specific foods for, for combating that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yes, a lot. Um, so it's about, um, she said, how much uh, water is good a day. Um, and it's about half our ideal body weight in ounces. So, you know, if you're 120 pounds, 60 ounces a day, um, and, and, that's, and that's your, you know, more your, towards your ideal body weight. Um, does that make sense? So the, um, the one thing you have to worry about with um, other things like tea and coffee is, you know, I have some people come in, oh, I'm drinking, you know, 40 ounces, it's all coffee. Um, well, if it's caffeinated, uh, caffeine is actually a diuretic. So I say, well, for every cup you just drink of that, you've got to drink two more glasses of water to make up for that because caffeine blocks the kidney's ability to hold on to water. 
So you're diuresing yourself. And so then you're going to be chronically dehydrated, which is not healthy. Um, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. You had something that about cutting out dairy mm -hmm. to relieve constipation. Mm -hmm. Um, because dairy is, is really high in fat and calcium, and that calcium will slow down gut motility, um, whereas mag things that are high in magnesium, which are all fruits and vegetables mostly, um, actually helps um, move it. I always think of it like C for calcium constipation and M for move um, magnesium. So it's the opposite. So yes, yeah, so um, dairy is very constipating. Um, it's amazing what people... Um, will come back and say, you know, the, you know, how many bowel movements they're able to have um, more when they get on this type of diet. Um, the diameter of the, sorry, y'all are done with lunch. The diameter of the stool increases, which it should be because it's bulked with fiber. Um, so there's no straining. That's why hemorrhoids are almost non-existent and why diverticulitis is almost non, and why appendicitis is almost non-existent in places where they really just have a plant-based diet. Yeah, so plant milks are great. The only thing you want to do is just read the label because a lot of them are going to add sugar because sugar is addictive and it'll make you buy more and that's what the food industry is trying to get you to do. But as long as it's an unsweetened um, plant milk, almond milk is great, oat milk, flax, there's, there's a lot, soy, there's a lot of them out there and they're, in, and, and they're good for you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thanks much. guys. Thank you for your time and all your expertise. As, as always, we are recording, of course, and this will be available on the website as soon as Tom can get it to us and edited. And the slides are always available there, too. So I know a lot of you are taking notes, but we will, those will be on there. So as soon as the link is up, I will send it out. If you're, not, if you're someone who does not get our regular um, monthly newsletters, make sure you sign up before you leave so that you can get the information.